Okay, I don't know what I'm going to talk about, but uh, Venkat has uh, written something about uh, my transition to barefoot running. And uh, of course, he said, can you make it scientific? Because Venkat is like that. He wants everything, everything scientific, all about cases and studies and everything. But, uh, and he gave me this book called um, Tread Lightly. I don't know if any of you have read this book, any of you sitting here. But it's a really nicely written book. I've forgotten who the authors are, but very, very uh, well written. And it mostly deals with um, all, uh, uh, most of the things that we talk about when we, when we talk about running. Amateur athletes talk about running in terms of what are the footwear to use, uh, how people get injured, stride, cadence, technique, form, all those things. So various chapters are uh, related to various things about running. So Vinkat said, you read this book, and uh, it'll give you an idea of all the research that has been done and all the case studies that have been done to shed some light on all these different things that runners constantly talk about. So I read the book, and as I said, it was really well written. But when I came to the end of the book, and even while reading the book, I, I was a little confused. Because there were so many uh, case studies done and so much research done. And finally, in the end of it, there was very little conclusion. It's all like, uh, OK, our knowledge is a work in progress. We are learning how to run. Even the scientists, uh, and here we are not talking about uh, um, uh, what uh, world-class athletes. We are talking about amateur runners and mostly distance runners. So all the research that I found in that book, all the papers, and I went through a few of them, and at the end of the book, if you see, all, all the chapters are summarized. And in the summaries, you really understand that nobody knows anything about running. It's true. Nobody. All the, all the research done with all those sample groups and profiles and runners and non-runners and premium athletes, all of them point to the fact that really we know nothing. So whether the uh, research is done by uh, uh, scientists at universities or they're done by uh, shoe companies, uh, they all point to the fact that this may work. We should try it out. And some of, uh, some of the people make a lot of money getting you to try out stuff. Not you, sorry, me also, everybody. Getting uh, amateur runners to try out new things. Because every time they do some research, they find out something new. And then they make a product on it. And then they, uh, they ask you to try out that product. And of course, because this is still a journey, the product doesn't work. Because we don't know whether it actually works or not. So what I want to say here is that I don't know anything about running. Okay, even though I've come here to talk about it. The combined knowledge that I see in this room about running is far superior to what I know. Or maybe what I will ever know, because I think this journey is, is endless. You know? And every single person knows as much as they need to know about themselves running. It's always an individual thing. And that is what I got also from the book, a lot of it, is that whether it's uh, they, they talk about pronation, whether they talk about arches, flat feet, uh, what cadence is good, it all finally depends on what your lifestyle has been. Have you been running or not? How long have you been running? What your physiology is? How long your legs are? You know what kind of uh, exercise you have been used to? The variables are so much that nobody can generalize what is the best way to do anything. So the best way for you has to be learned. And that is what I have been doing uh, in the last 11 years. I started running um, uh, with the first Mumbai Marathon, as I, I know a lot of people did. And that's why the Mumbai Marathon is actually something that has changed the face of, uh, I think, a concept of fitness in India, a concept of health, concept of exercise. It's really gone beyond just being one marathon in one city. It's become a movement uh, throughout India. And I think uh, soon the number of runners in India, uh, amateur runners like us, is going to exceed uh, the runners in any other part of the world. I, re I really believe that. And it's all thanks to this one, uh, one event. So that is quite amazing. So did anybody want to say something here? Uh, don't, feel free to interject at any point and ask me a question about what I'm saying. So I used to hate running. Okay, When I was 
a, a swimmer. I used to be in the national swimming team. And I know, of course, that all sports people who are not runners hate running. Because they're forced to run in their warm-ups and in their off-season. And they're not doing the thing that they love, which is their sport. So they hate it. And I hated it. Okay, we were forced to run, whether I was in Patiala at a coaching camp or Delhi, we were forced to run three or four kilometers every day and we used to cheat all the time. You know, we used to go around the corner, hide over there and come back from somewhere else and tell the coach, ha, ho gaya, ho gaya, ho gaya. <laughs> let's, let's get in the pool now. So, when, uh, but I had, I had, actually when I was a kid, I had a dream that I wanted to run a full marathon. It, it was just like one of those things that kids have, you know, that if you're, if you're or, or boys, if you're a real man, this is something you have to do. And to me, that one thing was, there were two things actually. One was climbing Everest, and one was running a full marathon. Even though I hated it, it was still a dream for me. So even though Everest never happened, even though it's just like the next country, and I thought Indians would never run, in 2004, the Mumbai Marathon started, and I said, now it's in my backyard, I have to do it. So I trained for um, the half marathon, and I was wearing Pegasus. I don't know if anybody knows this shoe, very popular Nike shoe. And um, I trained for f three or four months. It was torture. When I got to, I can do five kilometers now. It was horrible. I got to 10 kilometers. It was worse. 15 kilometers, I just wanted to give up. But when I got to this figure of 21, and maybe it's a psychological thing because everybody talks so much about it, the 21 and the 42 and the 21 and the 42, and there's such important milestones. They become in your head that when I could, abs could do this, uh, this distance of 21 kilometers comfortably, after just training for three or four months, after hating running, suddenly my whole mindset changed. I don't know how it happened. It was like magic. And I felt that when I crossed that finish line at 21, I think in two hours, five minutes or something, I was like, this is amazing. I, am, I felt like a king. And I know all of you have felt that. You know, whoever has, has, has done a little bit of distance running, whoever's done even a half marathon has felt this, that you feel there's nothing in life now that I cannot do. Not even a full marathon is nothing. I have done the first, my first big milestone is a half. And from that moment, because of that feeling, that euphoria, that sense of nothing can ever beat me, you know, I became addicted to it. And it happens to everyone, all runners. So. Next six months, you want to do a full. Three months after that, you want to do 100. Uh, next year, you're going to run from city to city, or you're going to run in the desert to somewhere 250 kilometers. You know, you start, yeah, 1,500 kilometers. OK, but that I did after 10 years, OK? Uh, today, it's different. I remember when I started running in the Mumbai Marathon, there were probably uh, just two or 300 runners who did the full, 250 runners who did the full. Today, there are close to 4,000. So it has grown, it has grown a bit. Uh, the focus probably isn't uh, so much on promoting full marathon running here, but creating a bigger community. So if you see the community now, it's even difficult to get into uh, the Mumbai Marathon. But luckily for us, and uh, there, are, there are so many entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurial runners today, uh, who have started their own events all over the country, that now it is easier for us to get to that space, to get into that space that really changes our lives. And the running community has grown, I think, from 15 events in 2004 to almost 150 or 200 events today all over the country. So like I was saying, I got, to, got into that thing of, you know, I, I, I love this. And I started running almost every day. And um, the thing about running is you, you naturally get conditioned. It's a new, new movement. So the more you run, the faster you get. Not that you have to really train for it, because at, at two, two hours for a full marathon, you're not actually running, you're only jogging. Right, So I started improving uh, gradually. After five years, I, I did the full. It, it took me that long, not because I was, uh, you know, I feared the distance or anything like that. I was just enjoying running 21 kilometers so much that I didn't bother taking the next step. Today, it's become very competitive, I, I, I see. And that has also led to a lot of uh, uh, runners getting injured uh, because uh, of, of, of doing too much too soon, but I'll come to that soon. And I, I decided to uh, try out something new. When I got to the full, I didn't really feel that kind of elation that I'd felt when I did the half. I said, no, it's okay, full, you know? So, uh, 
I, con I continued running. So for me, it was fun to run. I never looked at uh, timings. I never wore a watch. This watch I stole from somebody yesterday because I want to pace myself tomorrow. But I never wear a watch. And I don't, I don't really look at timings, personal bests and things like that. Because for me, uh, my goal is to get to the finish line, have a lot of fun, and feel like I can run another 10 kilometers. That is my goal, to run the full comfortably and easily, not to kill myself doing a, a best timing. But of course, everybody has their reasons for doing things. So uh, what happened uh, in my head is that I wanted to understand how to run more and more comfortably and more and more easily rather than how to run faster. So then I uh, started doing uh, some research uh, on the net. And ob obviously, barefoot running came up. This was about four or five years ago. Born to Run had been published, but I had not read the book yet. Uh, and I, I, of course, found some papers written by uh, Dr. Lieberman at Harvard uh, talking about the evolution of um, the human running animal, persistence hunting, and so on, and how it's the natural way of running is to run barefoot. And of course, that appealed to me tremendously because it's logical. You know, we're not born with shoes. And uh, the, the, the human body has evolved uh, over four million years. Obviously, it has its own sense of understanding of the right way to do things. So if it's uh, something so natural as running, such a natural movement as running, and your body's actually evolved to do it, you don't really need to wear shoes. That is the logic. So I decided to experiment with barefoot running. So of course, the first, uh, I, 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 I didn't know about Vibrams then or Vibrams, and I didn't know about uh, these other running sandals that existed. So I ran a little bit in socks. So yeah, I, I took off. Uh, one day I, I, I was running, I was maybe a 15, 20K. The last kilometer, I took off my shoes and I ran in socks. Now, of course, I didn't take my socks off because my uh, feet were so sensitive that I probably would find this surface uncomfortable. You know, and, that, and that's what happens to most of us. We are so used to wearing really soft fabrics and cushions and everything under our feet that they, they, they cannot abide any other surface. So I, I ran a bit in socks and I felt somehow a kind of freshness. Even after that 15 or whatever distance I was doing, after I ran this final one kilometer, I felt a kind of freshness. And of course, I didn't understand it. So I said, maybe it's the weight of the shoe. You know, I've just taken off. At that time, I was wearing um, um, Vomero. I don't know if you know Vomero. Yeah, so it's, it's a slightly, it's a very cushioned shoe, a, a little bit heavy. And I thought, maybe it's that. You know, I've taken off this shoe, so I'm feeling really light, even though I've finished so much. But uh, the more I uh, started running in socks, so I ran till I got to maybe half a kilometer in socks. Then, of course, I couldn't wear socks anymore because they tore. And all the socks I, I kept we wearing would tear. And then I finally got these Vibrams. Somebody, I can't remember who um, uh, recommended them, and somebody got them for me from America, and I wore them. Of course, it was very difficult because your toes never fit in Vibrams. I'm sure lots of you have encountered that. So I cut off the toes. It was very good, you know? I cut off the toes, and now, today, I think that uh, in the barefoot uh, shoe category, the Vibrams are the best if you cut off the toes. I should tell them, but I haven't gone around to telling them that yet. Like a lot of uh, the complaints, there are two complaints on Vibrams. One is that your toes never fit because there are two kinds of, generally two kinds of toes that human beings have. One is the Morton's toe and one is the Egyptian. The Egyptian foot and the, the Morton's toes, where your, your second toe is longer than your big toe, is a Morton's toe. And if you have beautiful feet like mine, then it's Egyptian foot, right? But even my beautiful feet did not fit in the Vibrams. <laughs> so I had to cut off the toes and I immediately felt a big difference in my perception of what I was doing. I thought I was running really, by that time I had come to a 345 in the full marathon and I had come to about a 135 in a half marathon. So I thought I was running really fast, you know. But when I wore these Vibrams and I started running, I got this feeling that all this while, it was now seven years since I had started running, that I'm not, I have not actually been running. I've been jogging. And there is a big difference between jogging and running in the style. We use it very loosely, these terms, jogging, running, you know, and so on. And if you want to go into the, the scientific uh, 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 um, comparisons between how, say, four-legged animals run and we run, they have 
three or four different styles based on the speed that they're running with. And we have basically only one. We have, we run, whether we're running slow or fast, we run with the same style. You know, horses, for example, have a different style. They have a trot, they have a canter, they have a gallop. And all of them, uh, you know, involve different mechanics in their body. But we have only one. So, but I felt that the difference between jogging and running is something very, uh, and this is my, okay, let me say that I'm not a scientist, which I'm sure you know, but it's my personal experience that um, when you're jogging, you're using more the front of the leg. This is the experience that I got, that you're using your quadriceps a lot. And I think that comes from the fact that when we spend a lot of time walking and we don't run, maybe for 15 or 20 years, we, we lose the use of our running muscles. So when we start to run, when we say run, but we're running at like eight minutes a kilometer, you know, which, is, which is really very, very slow, we begin by using our quadriceps for support. We are not engaging the core. We are not engaging the glutes. We are running with our quads. So it's really a faster walk with bent legs. And, I and you can go quite fast with that which is what I was doing. But what happens is, the stresses that it, it creates when you're using the wrong muscles, obviously leads to injuries. When you do too much of it, because that is not how your body is evolved to run. That is the feeling I got. Then, of course, I ran with Vibrance for uh, about two and a half years. And I really felt a big difference then because of that perception or then I learned later it's a kind of proprioception where your body responds to the environment. That, and, and, and that's the truth, you know, it's not just your legs. When we look at running, sometimes we get involved too much with isolating different parts of your body as what they're supposed to do. But running, I believe, the whole body should be involved in that movement. And we talk about it, but we don't understand what it means that the whole body is involved in this movement which is running. You're thinking about, okay, your legs are running, and yeah, my hands are moving, my, but there are different parts. There's your, there's your hips, your pelvis, your core, you know, all different parts of your body must come together as one to give you the most efficient and powerful running movement. So I felt that because I took off my shoes, I was beginning to understand that. And my entire style of running changed quite dramatically. Like I found and I was still reading about it on the net and looking at videos and so on of uh, children running because children, I, I, I feel, run the most naturally and not really small children because they're not uh, physiologically developed that much but say 10 to 11 year olds who are almost, almost mature, just pre-puberty. So the, uh, it's like uh, some people are short and some people are tall but when they're babies, the proportions are almost the same. If you see, even the, if there's a Kenyan or a Haryanvi in India who, who, who suddenly when he grows up, he's this tall or somebody from the Northeast or somewhere else or Maharashtra will be short. When they're babies, the proportions of their limbs are almost the same. So they run in a very similar style. So till they reach that age, so now the limbs have grown out slightly, but they've not shot up because that's something that happens post puberty. And uh, they're about 10 or 11. If you go on the net, you'll find these videos. So we, all, we are all Google scientists, you know, I'm also a Google scientist. So I go and I see that the way this child is running is almost perfect in terms of the efficiency of movement. And he's doing it absolutely unconsciously. And all children do that. But when we run, we are thinking about how my foot is falling, you know, where, how I'm doing this, how I'm doing that, how I'm breathing, and so on, because we have not run for maybe 20 years. Most amateur athletes start running at the age of 35, probably. I started at 38. So we have forgotten how to run. Not only have we have forgotten how to run, we have forgotten the feeling of running, and we, we, we have actually uh, caused the muscles that are re used to run to deteriorate. Now, if you have been running from childhood, then probably you will still run in a very efficient style when you start running more at the age of 35, but very, very few people do that. There are even, there are a few, probably a few athletes who have been running in uh, um, school or college, then they give it up and then they come back. You would expect them to run correctly, but even they don't. I've even observed those, uh, those people. And they get all kinds of injuries which they never got 
when they were doing huge volumes when they were younger, up to the age of even 15 and 16, a huge distance is a mileage in terms of for training, maybe up to 150 kilometers a week. Uh, for, so for a, for a child, I think that's a lot. But when they start running again, after not running for 15 years, it's all gone. They cannot manage to remember what they were doing then. So this, for me, it was, a, it was a really a big learning experience to take off my shoes and run and feel my whole body coming together as one. And those muscles, which I didn't have, slowly being built. And, I, and I, then I took off my uh, even Vibrams about nine months ago. And then I realized that the difference even from Vibrams to barefoot is the same as it is from shoes to Vibrams. That's incredible. You know, it, it's so, it's so on, on the one hand, complex. Like, why should it be like that? But I think it all comes down to the fact that your body begins to move as one organism. And it's not just your legs or just your core or just your hips. Everything begins to move together. And it only begins to move together because your feet can actually feel the ground. That, to me, was, again, personally, to me, a big, big eye-opener, that my foot, so even this 2mm or 3mm of rubber is coming between me understanding how my body functions. It's a big difference. It was a big difference for me. So now, of course, I'm doing my first barefoot uh, full marathon tomorrow. And there are many, many uh, people who have done barefoot, uh, uh, barefoot marathons. Uh, the first, the most famous one that we know, of course, is Abebe Bikila, who won the 1960 Rome Olympics marathon. And that was the first time uh, the world stage had seen a barefoot runner winning a world-class event. So even that was like, uh, like, wow, this is something that we need to study. People have forgotten that, that running is a natural activity and you don't need shoes. In fact, in, in that period, after, uh, up till the 1970s, a lot of American runners, distance runners, used to run, run barefoot. And they don't run barefoot anymore. Because um, uh, the running shoe was created for recreational runners only in the 1970s, or maybe slightly earlier than that. And that fueled the running boom in, uh, in I would say, I don't like to say middle-aged, but runners of slightly advanced years. <laughs> but oh, uh, people who wanted to get back into doing some kind of regular activity, and that happens normally post the age of 30. And to, to facilitate that, the shoe companies put in certain uh, 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 factors that made it easier to run. But what happens when something is made easier for you? You get dependent on it. You do not develop your own strengths. If something is made easier for you, you will never get better. It has to be made tough. You must be able to work under real circumstances. So what are real circumstances? Real circumstances are your feet and the ground. You cannot have something propping you up and helping you you're never going to learn. So that is what I felt in the last uh, nine months or so, that it is so important that even if you want to run in shoes, you must do drills of barefoot running. Because that barefoot running will really help you to position your body better automatically. You don't have to try anything. Do it like this or do it like that. Like so many people told me, engage the glute. OK, what does it mean? Does anybody know? OK, so you, unless you feel it, you don't know what it means. OK, am I engaged in the glute? Am I? Maybe. I don't know. But when you feel it, then you, ah, oh, that was it. I got it. I got it. I felt it. I felt it here. You know, so that came to me after how many? Eight, eight and a half years of running, I engaged the glute. <laughs> I mean, it took me that long to learn that not only was I not running, I was running with the wrong muscles. You know, so after I got this thing of, yeah, I can feel it now, I can feel it, and I'm now running and I'm pushing, pushing with this, uh, then I learned that, you know, um, what we do generally when we start to run, and I'm saying we're using the quads more, is that we run more in front, you know, like this. Whereas the actual running movement is behind. That is when you engage the glute because it pushes, it helps you to push, and then your hamstrings, and then your calves. So it's actually an entire mechanism here, right from your hip down to your Achilles tendon or your heel and the entire foot that should come into the movement, but which we don't bring into the movement, generally. 
So this whole exploration for me led me to believe that barefoot running is the best. It's not the cleanest, because if you run in Bombay, then you know, you're running in shit and all kinds of stuff. But it's definitely the best for me. I mean, I, another thing I'd like to say is I've never been injured. In the, in the 11 years that I've been running, and we ran, I, I ran with a few uh, people, I think Raj is here. Uh, Raj, where are you? Raj, Vadgama, uh, Mahesh Salvi, I don't know if anybody, uh, any of the others. Five people ran from Delhi to Bombay without any injury. When people keep telling us that, you know, you can only run a certain distance, if you run a full marathon, you have to rest for this much time, and then you need this much recovery, you need this much that and this. But to me, personally, this was also another kind of exploration, is what is my body really capable of? Let me try it. As an amateur runner, let me try this. Let me run 1,500 kilometers. And it's, it's shocking how your body adapts. Just, you know, to the first day, of course, was really crazy. I was, after that, I was like this. Because we didn't train for it. You can train to run 160 kilometers once. You can't train to run 60 kilometers every day. That only comes when you do it. So the first day was we were walking around like, I mean, at least I was collapsing. Raj was, of course, in great shape. But by the 10th day, so you, first your body goes down like this. You know, it's almost collapsing. Then suddenly it learns, okay, this is what it is. It begins to assimilate stuff that it needs to assimilate from your food that you're eating or whatever understanding the body has, which I have great respect for. And suddenly, my body became fresh. After 600 kilometers, in 10 days, my body became fresh. Look, looking at you, my body has become fresh. OK. So that was another big learning experience, that don't underestimate. One, don't underestimate your body. Secondly, again, I learned. Because by the 14th day, again, I was going to collapse. Because then, I was doing too much. And I told Raj also, I think on the 14th day or the 15th day, I said, Raj, I don't think I can do this. And Raj said, no, no, come on, what do you mean? Of course you can do it. And of course we did it. But then your mind and your body work together. And I think uh, that is, again, something that running taught me. And uh, maybe barefoot running has only enhanced that, that your mind and your body and your spirit, these three energies, once they start working together, that feeling is something that is indescribable. And scientifically, we, I think we may call it, uh, you know, endorphins released and endocannabinoids uh, uh, released and serotonin and all kinds of chemicals in the brain. But I just feel it's these three energies coming together and working as one, that is what gives you the high. That you know this is the way it's meant to be. And once you're in that space, this is the way it's meant to be, that is bliss. You know? Okay, now I'm going into spiritual. Let's not get there. Let's not go there. So, <laughs> so anyway, so this is my journey uh, till today. Tomorrow, of course, I'm doing my first uh, barefoot half. I've done um, uh, two or three uh, 30 pluses. I've done uh, three weeks of uh, 100 uh, plus uh, kilometer weeks. So I'm happy. Hopefully, it'll be a nice, easy, comfortable uh, run tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions for me at this point, or are you all going to sleep? I can't see you very clearly because I wear glasses. But if you're not asleep and you have any questions, you can ask me now. Thank you. You didn't even hear me saying anything. <laughs> yes. To try it. To try it. I said even as a drill, because you, you understand how your body responds to the ground and that gives you a better posture, a better understanding of what your body is actually doing. But yes, the reason why you need to get into it very gradually and a lot of uh, runners who start running barefoot or in minimals uh, complain about uh, calves uh, being sore is because when you come out of wearing a shoe which has a drop, your calves have shortened and your Achilles tendon has shortened. So if now you're going to start running barefoot and you're going to be stretching it out with every step, you cannot take that many steps. Uh, you know, the first time or even the second time or the third time. Because for your muscles and tendons to respond, it takes a period. It could take six months, it took, could take eight months, it depends on you, on the individual runner, how much their body responds and their muscles, how quickly they respond to change. But obviously you cannot do it suddenly. So it took me, uh, 
when I started wearing Vibrams, I went back to one kilometer, even though I was a full marathon runner. And it took me about one and a half years to get to a half marathon. Which is difficult to have that kind of patience with yourself. Because you're already, you know, so much into that thing about running fast and long distances that to get back to one kilometer and then two and then three, it, it's tough. But you have to do it like that. You have to. I won't. No, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what happens. The thing is, firstly, you get so used to that feeling. And of course, if you go into that spiritual uh, thing again, they talk about the energy from the ground that you get. And that could have been also some of the freshness that I felt, though I didn't want to go into it there, uh, is that there is, a, there is a, a cycle of energy that goes through the atmosphere and through the ground and through you, and you become uh, one with it. And when you wear a, uh, an insulation like this, that's why the uh, tribals say that natural, they don't say it because they don't know, but uh, they wear <laughs> natural fibers and it works better. And people who are, are of a more scientific bent of mind, they, they differentiate between, uh, say, rubber and, uh, and natural fiber. And they say that, obviously, the energy flow through an insulating substance like this will be less. So uh, another, another thing is that uh, my foot size increased by one whole size. Right? I used to be a US 12, now I'm a US 13. And not only does the size uh, increase, but also the shape, it changes. Because what is the natural uh, form of the foot is the metatarsals lead into the toes in a straight line. But when you wear shoes, unfortunately the way shoes are constructed is they go into a taper in the front. And some shoes really go drastically into a taper. So the toe box in any kind of shoe is still not enough. They talk about toe wiggle and there's enough room in the toe box and so on. But it's never enough, according to me. And so when you take off your shoes, your feet really spread. You know, because that's what they're meant to do. The feet are actually meant to stabilize your body when you're running. And that stability then makes your knees stable, your hips stable, your spine stable, all of that stable. Now what shoes have done is artificially, they have created stability shoes, which of course, the, you see the sole, it goes wider than, than, the, than the shoe. That is to give you stability, but we've already got it. You know? So when you begin to train your foot again to do that, it responds immediately. So when, now when I wear a shoe, it's very uncomfortable for me because my foot feels constricted. And if it's supposed to spread like this, it's now like this. So I'm, I'm running like that. That's the feeling I get, that I'm now in hooves. You know, I, I'm not supposed to have hooves. I'm supposed to have feet. Sorry, shoes. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, you have a question? You said something? No, no, okay. <laughs> See, I'm not against shoes, am I? <laughs> Everybody, okay, let me make, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I just want to make a point here. That um, the body, again, the, re, the, the way it adapts is that your body can also adapt to shoes. So if you are not uh, overstretching yourself in a way, and again, I said this is an individual thing. So some people can adapt to shoes better, some people adapt to barefoot running better. So if your body has adapted to a certain kind of footwear, it might even be best to continue with that footwear. You know, there is nothing really wrong with wearing shoes, but I feel if you want to really understand, then you need to take your shoes off. That's why I said that even if you're wearing shoes, drills barefoot to train your mind and your body to kind of come together and understand the basic biomechanical movement of running, it's better as a drill. But it doesn't mean you have to always run barefoot. Now to answer your question, yes, I run in Bombay barefoot. Is it safe? Is it safe? Okay. Mard hai na? Mard ko abhi dard nahi hota. Okay, listen. Water for the infection and had to be treated because he picked up something. Not a mard then. Okay. Now, <laughs> not mantastic. Okay. No, okay. I, I tell you, there, yes, uh, glass, uh, sharp objects, gravel, it's all there. I have run over bottles many times. Okay, not many, three. Three times. I, I ran over a broken bottle. In fact, in Pune, I remember, uh, Nikhil, do you remember I told you? Where's Nikhil? Yeah. In the Pune running, um, uh, I did the f my first barefoot half marathon I did in Pune with Pune running. And I ran over a bottle. I saw it too late. So my foot was already, I was already in midair and I landed on the bottle. It was broken. Nothing happened. Because. No, 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 no,
I'll tell you another thing that happens. See, when you start running barefoot, you start running more lightly. You know? And running lightly doesn't mean pushing off the ground with your feet. It means raising your body with your core. So, I mean, we can go on talking about this forever. We might talk, keep talking about different things. But you're, when, you, when you run lightly, your core is engaged very strongly. It keeps your body straight. Right? So most runners, if you see, they run like this. A lot of casual runners, you know, see them running like that, with the whole core collapsed like that. So this, this movement, leading with the chest, is really important. That is one thing that you can pick up from elite athletes, not their footfall and shoes and things like that. Body position. But to keep that body position, you need tremendous strength in the core. And not the upper, like the core is divided in the lower core. You need tremendous strength. And when you do that, I don't know if you've ever heard of the story of Yamaguchi, who was a Japanese martial artist who used to stand on a matchbox and it would not collapse. Okay? And then six men could not lift him. Of course, these could be untrue stories. But they've come from some germ of truth that you have the power to lift your body and it doesn't mean that you use your legs. You use the core. The core is actually the most powerful part of your body. And all movement, all movement depends on the core. And we know that with dancers, with martial artists, with all kinds of uh, sporting activities, so also with running. This is the most important thing. And it's not enough to just do planks or static uh, uh, strengthening exercises. It's important to understand the connection of the core with the lower body and the upper body. How does it connect and therefore how does it work? So when you're running over rough surfaces or glass or anything, you run over it so lightly that it does not pierce your skin. It's not like my skin is made of uh, steel or it's become hard or anything like that. I have soft feet. Anybody can come and touch them and tell me. <laughs> but but, <laughs> but the, f the thing is to run lightly. So also what shoes do is, and I've been through it, they, may, they encourage you to run lazily because of the cushioning. You know, people run like this. This is not, you have to run like that. You know, so you don't spend that much time on the ground. So whatever you're running over, it will not affect you. Now a tetanus, hookworm, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> okay, I know a lot of people got hookworm when they weren't running also. Or, sorry, infections. No, it's true. It's true. You have to be careful and I'm telling you, when you are barefoot, it increases your awareness of your surroundings. Of every part of your surroundings. The air, the traffic, people, dogs, garbage, road, Everything, you become more aware of it. And automatically, you save yourself from that. It's like, again, if you see in these martial arts movies where they see the hero is wearing a blindfold and he still wins the match. It's like that. When you start barefoot running, it's like you don't need to look, but you see everything. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. All right. Then, any more questions? You have a question? Yeah. Oh, you're getting up to take my mic? <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Venkat, for uh, inviting me here. And I wish there'd been more questions because I, 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 learn, I learn from questions, right? And we all learn from questions. Either you ask yourself the questions or you ask other people the questions and then you think about what they said. But thank you very much. It was great being here. All the best for tomorrow. All of you are running. Have fun. Happy running. And uh, may the roads be velvet and may you have the wind at your back.